discourse. It's where Jesus speaks about the end times. And the disciples ask Jesus, when will your coming be? And what will the signs be? And believe me, there's been a lot of talk um, about that. Um, but Jesus also then answers certain pre Supposed questions. What is it going to be like when Jesus comes back? Um, and in chapter 25 of Mark, uh, of Matthew, he gives us three different illustrations of what is it going to be like. Right. Before we get to our portion of Scripture this morning. Is everybody over here going to heaven? Right, we're going to heaven. Why are you going to heaven one day? And I'm sure you'd be able to answer and say to me, because I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Last week we had a a baptism And people declared their faith and trust in Jesus. Is that the right answer? Right. Well, now I want to read a a story to you. And it's right out of your Bible. And it's from Matthew chapter 25, reading from verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes, and this isn't so much a, a parable... Um, it's, it's not like the other stories. This is very different. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. How did He come the first time? Baby born in a manger. Um, you know what a manger is? It's where cows eat. Um, yeah, he's coming back. On uh, he's going to come and sit on a throne in heavenly glory. He didn't come in glory the first time; the glory was inside of him. All nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. What's the difference between left and right? Oh, well, you know, that's just, you know, left is left and right is right. Um, Right hand is your hand of favor. Jesus went and sat at the right hand of God. It's a place of, of favor. It's God's blessing. The left hand is not. The king will say to those on the right, who are those, sheep or goats? Man, come you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the king of the kingdom, prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, and we gave you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, invite you in, needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or infirm or unsure and in prison? And go to visit you, the Lord in prison? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, who's on his left? Okay, what noise does a goat make? Oh dear. What's that song about the farmer and what? 
Old MacDonald. We're going to be doing that somewhere in the sermon. Okay. And then we'll get to the goat. Um, yeah, no, get that song out of my head now. <laughs> he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You are cursed into eternal fire, not temporary fire, eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, stranger, need clothes, sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous, the sheep, go meh. To eternal life. I asked you a question. Why are you going to heaven? And we can easily answer and say, Hey, I believe in God. It's a Christian. Well, um, now I need to ask you some questions over here. <coughs> How many of you fed Somebody during this week that was hungry, other than your own family, moms. Did you feed anybody that was hungry during this week? Or do you go along and give the food to Bertie so that Bertie can feed hungry people? But did you feed somebody that was hungry? Did you come across anybody that was thirsty today, during this week, this month, and give them something to drink? Or did you, you know, when you heard Beaufort West hasn't got water, go and get your five liters of water and send it off to Beaufort West, and that's the sum total of thirstiness. Um... How many of you gave hospitality to a stranger? Well, maybe you gave unwanted hospitality to somebody that broke into your home and stole things. But it wasn't your hospitality. They took hospitality. How many of you clothed somebody they didn't have clothes during this week, this year. Oh, well, at Christmas time, we bought some socks for my dad to wear because you know what? He ain't got socks. At. And we bought shoes for people that don't have shoes in church. Every year, we empty out all our winter clothing because our size has changed. And so now we've got to get rid of all the old winter clothing and we donate it to the church to give away to others. Anybody look after sick people? Lord, we can't go near hospital. It's COVID. And anyway, we don't want to catch it. And we're unsure and uncertain. So now you want us to go and look after sick people, feeble people. In actual fact, the more feeble they are, the more isolated they should be.
Anybody over here visit a prison lately? Peter didn't put up his hand. He's not only untruthful, he's a liar. (laughs) Every week he's in prison, but fortunately they let him out. And so, you know what? Well, Peter, we bless you and we support you, brother. We'll pray for you. Go to prison. Did any of you ever in your life Go and visit somebody in prison. I want to go back to my question again. Why are you going to heaven? Because I believe in Jesus. And, and, and yet, when Jesus comes along and He begins to express His judgment, He begins to point out certain things that none of you are doing. Have we got a problem over here? Yeah, but as a Christian, I've been baptized. Um, did, did, did the Bible say, did Jesus say, um, did He ask them which church they belonged to? Did He ask them, were you baptized? Did He ask them, um, did you pray the sinner's prayer? Do you find it there? And when we look at this list of the different things that he's going, he says, this is what it's going to be like on Judgment Day. I'm going to ask you. And we sitting over here this morning, and how do we answer? How's your inventory for going to heaven? How's your inventory doing? Well, I need to help you a little bit this morning. When Jesus starts out with the story, He says, He comes, verse 31, Son of Man comes in His glory with His angels, and all nations will be gathered together before Him. Who's all nations? It's us. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separated, separates the sheep and the goats. Just in this story, do sheep become goats? Or do goats become sheep at the judgment day? No. They arrive over there at the judgment day, and the sheep and the goats are there. Hulles honor mekaar, hulles dier mekaar. They are together. They are living in Boetesig. They are living... Um, and going to Bosmansdam school or whatever, the the sheep and the goats, the sheep and the goats are in church. Yeah, but we've only got sheep in church. No. The sheep are all together. But on this judgment day, that's sheep, that's goats. And yeah, on this earth, Yes, sometimes we will look at one another and scheme, yeah, he is a rechte goat. And oh, look at that wonderful sheep. But you know what? Only God knows who are sheep and who are goats. 
And He will separate them. Believe me, <laughs> there are people that look like sheep, but they goats. And yet Jesus tells us how you're going to differentiate between a sheep and a goat. How He's going to differentiate between a sheep and a goat. And there's going to be a separation. And you read the separation. He says, listen, guys, you're waiting for me to come back, but me coming back, this is going to happen. There's going to be a judgment. Sheep and goats are going to be separated. Sheep are going to be on my right-hand side. Sheep are going to enter into my eternal blessing. But the goats are going to hell. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And that separation is going to happen before the judgment day. We're all together. We can look and we can say, by the fruit, the Bible says, we will know them. And on what grounds? God is going to judge. Jesus is going to judge. But I want you to know, it's not like judgment day comes and now, you know what, um, am I sheep or am I goat? No, you're going to arrive at the judgment day. Either you're going to be a sheep or you're going to be a goat. You don't become a sheep at the judgment day. You don't become a goat at this judgment day. You arrive there all together. And then he says, goats on that side, sheep on that side. Am I reading this correctly? One of the first things, and the Bible must always agree with the rest of the Bible. We aren't, say, we, we aren't saved by our works. In Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through your faith, your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of by works, so that no one can boast. Was Abraham saved? Abraham was saved because it was accredited to him as righteousness, the Bible says in the book of Romans, because he believed God. He had faith in God. The only way to become a sheep is through faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to believe in God, not by trying to act like a sheep. A couple of years ago, um, I was in prison, and they did let me out again. And when I went walking into prison, we went in with a whole lot of other workers, and Pierre experiences this every week. Um, it's so wonderful. Only sheep ministers go into do prison ministry. Is that correct, Pierre? If you look at Pierre over there, he is shaking his head. Sitting with you in the waiting room to go to the prisons, you might come across an imam. Is he a sheep or a goat? Sitting over there is um, uh, 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 the Jehovah's Witnesses. There are old and new apostolics coming to visit people in prison. They are spiritual workers. And there are folk coming in there from all different walks of life. Not all of them are sheep. But you know what? There are some folk coming in over there. And can you imagine now? I walk in over there now. Now, you know what? Hey, I... Um, I, I, I've got to become a sheep. And you know what the Bible says, uh, I was in prison, you came to visit me. So, so now, how many times must I go to prison 
to visit folk to turn from a goat into a sheep. Does that Jehovah's Witness, him going every day to go to Goodwood Prison, at some point or other, does that Jehovah's Witness, who Jesus said over here, I was in prison and you visited me, does he at some time become a sheep? No. It's by our, not by our works that we are saved, that we enter into heaven. But it's by grace. And if we had to boast because of our works, why do we need Jesus? James puts it another way. In James chapter 2, verse 14 to 18, what good is it, my brothers, fortunately doesn't appear, appear to count against sisters, if, no, it's, it's for everybody, if a man claims to have faith, but no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Huh. James, where did you get this from? Jesus, maybe? If one of him says, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs of those that are in need, what good is it? In the same way, your faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, deeds, is dead. You can have all the intellect in the world. You can understand spiritual things. You can answer the right questions with the right answer. But the answer is your deeds. If you say you've got faith, what deeds do you have that prove your faith? And faith without deeds is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. In James chapter 2, verse 26, he concludes it this way, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. I want to summarize it. True disciples will pass an examination, not because they are trying to pass the examination, but because they will love their brothers and sisters, and therefore love Christ. Would that fit in with the, the story of Jesus, what He's busy saying? Would everything that is mentioned over there, the food, the thirsty, the hospitality, the clothes, loving the sick, looking after them, prison, if it's not motivated by the love of Christ, and it's not, I, oh, well, now I've like a Jehovah's Witness, will go and he does it because he has to try and do it so that he can get into heaven by his works. I don't try and do that. It's just something that happens. The good works mentioned in this parable are not the cause of salvation, but the effect of salvation. In other words, it's something that I do naturally. I want to do it. In Mark chapter 9, verse 41, Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth. Whoever gives you a cup of water in my name, because he belonged to Christ, will certainly not lose his reward. In other words, the most menial action deed that is done 
in the name of Jesus to somebody else will not lose its reward. That's what Jesus is busy teaching. You know, as I read through, and I read this story many, many times, I've had to wrestle with it. (laughs) Jesus didn't say, hey, there were some Christians that were hungry, and you didn't feed them. There were some some oaks um, that were sick, and you didn't visit them. He doesn't say that. He says, I was sick. He says, I was in prison. He says, I was thirsty. In other words, he identifies with those people. And this reminds me of just another little incident where a certain man was busy traveling to Damascus to go and persecute the Christians over there. And God met him, Jesus met him on the way and said to him, Why are you persecuting the people in Damascus? Did he say that? No, he says, why are you persecuting me? Wow. And so when I do something in the name of the Lord, I do it out of response of His love and compassion I do it as unto the Lord in His name. As a young pastor, my pastor, Mac Hayward, introduced me to hospitals and hospital visitation. And one of the wards that... um, I got to walk into with a cancer ward in the provincial hospital in Port Elizabeth. It's a ward that you walked in and you went out feet first. You came there to die. There were about... A ward there was about 10. The worst patients were closest to the nurse's station and the furthest were those that could still get up and walk about. And and there were about six, seven on this side and seven on this side. And, And you would walk into people that were walking into hopelessness. You die. You live with cancer, but it gets to you eventually. And it's wonderful to walk in with Pastor Mac, but when I had to do it on my own, I would travel from West Ring, come down Cape Road, pull into the parking lot. I would sit in my car can't do this. Of what value am I to those men, those women in those wards that are busy dying? If you go into those wards, you watch somebody walk in over there with a bit of weight, and the next minute you see them start shrinking, you see the markings where they are busy having their different treatments, You see them at different stages. You see the sunkenness of their eyes. You see a skeleton begin to appear. And you walk in over there. And yeah, I am a young pastor to come and, Hey, hey, come guys, let's go. Many times I would stop my car. Look at what I've got to do. Think about that one in that corner. That woman over there, that man that I met last week, that his son comes every week and shaves him because he wants to look nice every day morning. And I would start my car up and go home. 
can't handle it. And I would battle. I thank God I overcame it. But in hindsight, I had to work out what was the problem, what was wrong. And I came to this conclusion. When I sat outside of that hospital, I did introspection and looked at myself and looked at me walking into that ward to go see my six foot four friend Ant, to fish with him. Becoming a skeleton. I've got nothing to offer. Anyway, I walk in there with my Bible, but it's, it's, it's like, it's, 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 it's just the Bible. And, and, and anyway, um, who am I? I? I'm not this great evangelist. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And all I was doing was I was looking at me. And there had to come a time in my life and in my ministry into that ward when I would arrive at that hospital. It's gloomy. It smells not lacquer. But I'd arrive over there. Lord, it's not Paul walking in over here. It's Paul and the Holy Spirit. We are going to go and visit some of your children, Lord. And if they're not your children, we're going to take the good news of Jesus to them. We're going to read the word of life to them. We're going to share the hope, not of this earth, not of a cancer treatment. We're going to share the hope of glory with them. His name is Jesus. And boy, from a guy, and, I, and it wasn't always like this, from a guy that was scared to walk in there, I would walk in there with boldness in my heart to go and visit somebody. I would go and take somebody's hand to pray with them. Not because of Paul, oh, and you can say a nice little prayer, and you've got super duper faith. No, but my eyes were fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. My strength comes from him, not from me. It's not my ability to visit prisons. It's not my ability to give water to the thirsty to clothe them, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you there are some people they don't need clothes. They need their hearts clothed with Christ. They need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and not with another spirit on our streets. They need to have not another chemical coming into their bodies, but they need the blood of Jesus to wash away their sins. And boy, you can go and do all the good works. But if those good works, and believe me, come from your flesh because of, oh, well, I can do it. But if it comes from Him, it's motivated from Him. And we do it as unto the Lord. When you are visiting those folk, when whatever you're busy doing it, you're doing it because He told you to do it. You're doing it not because hey, I, I, He told me. No, you've got a heart of compassion. I want to say to you this morning, sheep, they said to Him, but when did we do it? They didn't even realize that they had been doing it. And Jesus turned to them and said, Hey guys, you did it. You did it for me. Wow. So we were doing it all along. Yes. I don't know about you. As I've said, sat and I've studied this story and I've read lots about it. And I know the United Nations can feed people. The Jehovah's Witness can go and visit people. Hospitals 
Man, you get a whole lot of different kinds of people going to go visit people in a hospital. But, but, where there are men and women that are filled with the Spirit of God, they don't serve Him to try and get in His good books, but are in His good books. Their righteousness is not of their own works. They're not trying to prove a point. They're just being normal sheep. When they are busy doing what God told them to do, and it's not so much of, hey, this is the list, go and do it. No. It's the little cup of water. It's the most mundane things. It might be God stopping you in the middle of the day and you fall to your knees to pray for somebody. Hey, but nobody saw that work. Jesus says it. You did it for me. When your neighbors are obnoxious, they play loud music, they do all the wrong things in the book, but when you reach out to those neighbors with the love of the Lord and take a little bottle of jam and say, hey, I just want to bless you folk, this, we your neighbors, and, and I want you to know we, um, we bless you and we pray for you every day, we don't curse you. <laughs> If you're doing it to try and score points with God, well, no, you do it as unto the Lord. What's it going to be like on that judgment day? I want to tell you now, if you're sitting over here now, oh, am I a sheep or a goat? And there's something wrong. You must know, I'm a sheep. I heard His voice. I listen to Him. I follow Him. I listen to Him. I am born again. And so I don't... Judgment Day is coming. No. Have I got enough good works in the bank? No. He's done the good work. And, and we're going to come to the table of the Lord. And we've got nothing to boast about our works. All we can say it is for by grace, Jesus, that I have been saved. And I want to celebrate my faith and trust in you this morning. It's not of me. It's a gift from God. It's not my works so that I can boast. But I humbly bow my head before you in this church this morning. Anoint me for service, Holy Spirit. If you can serve God with your own strength, with your own personality, with your still voice, or your loud voice, with your own confidence, you've missed the mark. We need the helper. Jesus said, I'm going to send you a helper. And he will lead and guide you into all truth. No fear. No fear. No fear facing judgment one day. There is going to be a separation. He is going to ask them about their works. He is. Go read the book of Revelation. But to those that have put their faith and trust in Him, they express their faith by their work.